Hello and welcome. In today's message, we have come to Acts chapter 26. In this, the Apostle Paul is giving his final defense before uh, the governor Festus and King Herod Agrippa II, speaking about the reasons for the hope that is in him regarding the resurrection of the dead and specifically regarding the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana, and the First Reformed Presbyterian Church in Moss Bluff, Louisiana. I'm glad that you're with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come into your presence today asking that you would be our guide and our teacher from your holy word. We ask that you would take the written word of God and that you would engrave it upon our hearts and souls and minds and change us by it. Lord, our desire is to turn away from sin, to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, and then to grow in Christ and serve him all the days of our lives. Please cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and please take your word and use it in our lives this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now hear the word of God from Acts Chapter 26, beginning at verse 1 and reading to the end of the chapter, which is verse 32. Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, 
I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me, me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. The king stood up and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Amen. This is God's holy word. May he add his richest blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of it this day. The Apostle Paul has been giving his defense before Festus and before King Agrippa II. Uh, he is there defending his actions at Jerusalem, the actions uh, that uh, caused him to be arrested by the Roman army, actually delivered by the Roman army from a mob that was seeking to kill him at the temple. Uh, he is on his way to Rome for trial. Uh, he has appealed to Caesar. And uh, there are no charges, really, that Festus could come up with that he could give uh, to send along with the Apostle Paul to go to Rome for him to stand trial on. And so he had suggested to King Agrippa II, and Agrippa had agreed that they hear from the Apostle Paul. And so this meeting has been established. Uh, uh, Paul uh, has come and been brought in chains to stand before the governor and before the king and Bernice, uh, the king's sister, and also uh, other governors and prominent men from the city. And Paul is explaining the reasons that he is on trial. Uh, this is not a formal trial here. Everything has been suspended because of Paul's uh, appeal to Caesar in Rome. And therefore, what he is doing is he is explaining himself so that the governor might be able to have charges to write to send along with him when he goes to trial in Rome. And so what Paul is doing is being a faithful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had told Paul that he would stand before uh, kings and before governors, before leaders. And so he is doing that in this very instance. He's standing before the governor, uh, the Roman governor Festus, and he's standing uh, before King Herod Agrippa II. He makes his open re opening remarks here by simply stating uh, that he is glad to be able to make his defense before King Herod Agrippa because Agrippa is known to uh, have a certain knowledge of Jewish customs and traditions. And so he says he's glad to be able to make his defense before him. Uh, he is talking directly to Agrippa and throughout this passage, with the exception of the time that he uh, addresses Festus because of Festus' interruption. Uh, he addresses all of his remarks at King Agrippa. He is seeking to present the gospel to this man, uh, for this man has some Jewish background, and therefore Paul is hoping that he will be able to show that Christ is uh, the one who is uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, uh, that he is the one whom Moses and the prophets spoke of, and that Agrippa ought to understand this as well. And so he's going to appeal to him through the Old Testament scriptures. He begins, of course, by uh, giving the same type of defense that he has already given. This is the third time we read in uh, the book of Acts of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Uh, this is essentially the same defense. He starts out by talking about his manner of life prior to his conversion when he was a Pharisee. 
Then he goes on and talks about the actual conversion experience when he became a Christian and was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, he concludes that by talking about his Christian life, his ministry, what he has done since then, and begins to apply this directly to King Herod Agrippa II. Uh, he starts out uh, by speaking in the first 11 verses then uh, to uh, Herod and to Festus and giving his defense of his, uh, his life by starting uh, and explaining that he was raised as a Pharisee. Uh, this was an important uh, remark that he made before the Sanhedrin. He made the same remark once again when he uh, spoke before uh, the previous uh, governor, Felix, and also before Festus. And so uh, he talks about the fact that he was raised as a Pharisee. He was raised in Jerusalem. He was raised in that area. He was raised according to the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. And he believed those things. And one of the things that is taught by the Pharisees, that is believed by the Pharisees from the Old Testament, is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul says, why is it considered incredible among you people that if God does raise the dead. So he is talking about the fact that this is truly the reason that he is on trial, that the uh, Jews had all sorts of trumped up charges, that they tried to charge him with desecrating the temple, that they had tried to charge him with sedition against the Roman Empire. But in reality, the thing that he was on trial for was the resurrection of the dead and not just the dead in general, although that is part of this, but in specific, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. And so uh, it, he is going to be talking with them about Christ being raised and the importance of Christ being raised uh, for all those who do trust in him. And so what he wants Agrippa to see is that because the Old Testament teaches the doctrine of the resurrection, that this is not some foreign, strange uh, idiosyncrasy of the Apostle Paul, but rather uh, it is uh, indeed a belief in the fulfillment of the prophecies given in the Old Testament that they are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ by His resurrection. And so uh, in this uh, former life that he had prior to his conversion, Paul speaks about doing many, many hostile things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And the way he did that, of course, was to persecute the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, specifically to persecute and hound Christians. And he said he did this not only in Jerusalem, uh, not only did he throw uh, folks into prison, uh, but he also uh, went about uh, casting his vote against them when they came to trial. Now, that's an interesting remark because this may be an indication that Paul, as a younger man, was a member of the Sanhedrin, that he did have a vote, a say in what was to be done uh, for these people who were standing trial because he says he cast his vote against them. Uh, indicating that perhaps indeed at uh, that time when he was a Pharisee, prior to his conversion, he was a member, though a young man, a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and so he cast his vote against them. He cast his vote for them to be put to death. And so the Apostle Paul recognizes that. Not only did he want to imprison Christians, but he wanted pr uh, Christians to die for what he considered at that particular time to be blasphemy against God. And so he said he did this by going from synagogue to synagogue in Jerusalem and that even he was so zealous that he went to different foreign cities. Now, this is the only place in the book of Acts that we read about Paul going to other cities besides Damascus and Jerusalem, obviously, uh, hunting down Christians. Here he says he has done this. And so apparently there were other places Paul went prior to his going to Damascus. But it is the Damascus Road encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul focuses his life on because that's where his life changed. And so he says, as he went about pursuing them from city to city, uh, there came a time when under the authority of the chief priest with their commission, 
Uh, he was sent to Damascus. His intent was to go there, hound Christians, find them, arrest them, drag them back to Jerusalem, and cause them there to stand trial. And he hoped that he would be able to cast his negative vote, causing them to be put to death. And so that was his former manner of life. And then we come from that point to Paul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus. The Apostle Paul indeed was blinded by the light while he was on the way to Damascus. He speaks about uh, getting close to the city. It's noonday, the sun is shining brightly overhead, and suddenly there is a brighter light shining from heaven than the sun itself. The light is so bright, Paul says, that all of uh, his companions and he fell to the ground because of this great light. And so uh, he is uh, blinded by the light we know from uh, earlier in the book of Acts. He doesn't mention the blinding here, uh, but it is a tremendous light. Uh, And Paul is going to use that uh, term light in his uh, explanation of what he was called to do. And so uh, pay attention to the word light and to darkness also in this passage. They're contrasted here. And Paul is going to use them to illustrate what the gospel is all about. And so there is this blinding, great, glorious light, and it drives Paul and his companions to the ground because it is so powerful. Uh, But... When he falls to the ground, he alone hears a voice speaking to him. Now, he tells us that the others heard a noise, but they couldn't understand anything. So the others see a light, but they're not blinded by it. The others hear a sound, but they cannot understand words. Paul is the one who is the recipient of this revelation. Paul is the one who is blinded by the glory of this light. And Paul is the one to whom the risen Lord Jesus Christ addresses himself. And so Paul says he falls to the ground and he hears this voice speaking in his native tongue, the Hebrew dialect, saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And of course we know uh, that he is about to cry out uh, and ask, uh, who are you, Lord? Why, what are you doing? And uh, basically Jesus says something here, or Paul mentions that Jesus says something here, that is not related elsewhere. And that is, Jesus says to Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, goads were sharp sticks used by animal drivers uh, to cause animals who were known to kick back and try to kick their masters uh, to teach them not to kick. And so the sharp stick uh, was there, they would use it, and if the animal tried to kick back at the person Uh, who was driving it, uh, then instead of kicking the the leg of the owner, it would kick into that stick and that would hurt. And so the animal would learn not to kick back, not to fight back. And so uh, this is an illustration of the fact that an unwilling animal will learn to uh, give in to serve its master's will in order to escape the pain of doing otherwise. And what Jesus is saying to Paul is that what you have been doing up to this point is you have been kicking back against who I am and where I am going to send you. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now it's time for you to listen to me. And so Paul basically cries out, who are you, Lord? He knows God is speaking to him. He's surprised, as we saw once before, that this is God who has stopped him because Uh, He thinks he's on a mission, doing God's holy will, persecuting Christians. And now he hears these dreadful words, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh, There could be nothing more terrifying to a person who thought that Jesus was dead, who thought that Jesus uh, was a heretic, who thought that Jesus was a blasphemer, now to suddenly be taught No, Jesus was right. I have been wrong all along. I have been fighting against God rather than serving God. And now he is brought to the place where the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself clearly to Paul. And Paul hears these words and sees this. 
And uh, he realizes that Jesus is calling upon him uh, when he tells him, stand up on your feet. Uh, he's calling upon him to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer is he to persecute the church of Christ. No longer is he to persecute Christians. Now he is to become one. Now he is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he is to proclaim that very same doctrine that he hated. And that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something he didn't believe until this very moment. And now God has blinded him and opened the eyes of his soul to see the truth. And so Paul uh, learns all of these things. He learns that Jesus is indeed the Lord of glory. He has been blinded by the glory of God. He is called upon to stand up and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to proclaim the things that he had rejected up until that point. And so uh, he says, for this purpose I have appeared to you, Jesus says, to appoint you, and here's, here's the calling of, of Paul, a minister and a witness, not only of the things that you have seen, but also to things in which I will appear to you. And so uh, he says you're to talk about the things that you've already encountered. You're to talk about this experience upon the Damascus Road. You're to talk about who I am and what I have done for you. And there will be other things in the future that I will appear to you and I will reveal to you, and you are to speak of those as well. And so uh, those are the reasons that Jesus has appeared to the Apostle Paul to call him to go out from his own spiritual blindness in uh, to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to serve Christ as a minister of the gospel and as a witness. And that word witness is the word martyr. Uh, those two things are going to go hand in hand because in the end of his life, Paul will be martyred for the Christian faith, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's called upon to be a witness for Christ and a minister of the gospel that he had hated and had persecuted. And then Jesus says that he promises that he will rescue him both from Jewish enemies and from Gentile enemies as well. Uh, and it is to these latter folks, the Gentiles, that Jesus is sending Paul as his apostle. And so uh, this is the mission that he is about to embark upon. And it is the mission that was spoken of, prophesied, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, there are a couple of places uh, in Isaiah where uh, we read about uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ being a coming that's described in terms of turning the Gentiles from darkness to the light of God, from the dominion of Satan to God himself. That's what Jesus says that Paul is supposed to do. And that's in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, for example. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light, those who live in a dark land, on those who live in a dark land, a light will shine. And so obviously this was Christ that's being spoken of and Paul is to be his minister and he is to go to proclaim this. And then also in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 6 and 7, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations to open blind eyes and bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So this is what God the Father says that His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to do. It's a reference to Christ and His ministry of light. And Paul is called upon to be a minister of that, to uh, minister uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ as the, the light of Almighty God. And so Jesus is sending Paul to the Gentiles to proclaim this gospel of the light of the glory of God. And the result of this, Jesus says, it turned them from darkness to light, turned them from the dominion of Satan to God, to the kingdom of God, that they may, and so this is the result of that, that uh, through his preaching of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that through Christ they may receive forgiveness of sins, 
that through Christ they may receive an inheritance among all of the saints. And this comes about by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit who applies these things won by Christ to the elect of Almighty God. And he does so through the instrument of faith that he works in God's elect people. And so uh, Paul has given his uh, conversion experience. Uh, he has presented to King Agrippa and to Festus that the reason that he has been called to do these things is because the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. The Lord Jesus Christ set him apart as a minister. The Lord Jesus Christ gave him his marching orders uh, as a missionary, uh, told him that he would serve uh, to call people out of darkness into the kingdom of light, out of the dominion of Satan into the kingdom of God, and that through his preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through what Christ has done, that the Gentiles would come to receive forgiveness of sins, they would come to receive together with the uh, elect of the Jews an inheritance among all the saints, and that all of this would come about as the Holy Spirit applies this to them. And finally, the Apostle Paul then turns to his Christian life. Now, uh, that's his calling. What has he done since he became a Christian? And so he says to King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Uh, in other words, who am I? How could I possibly disobey what Christ has called me to do? I went and did what Christ has called me to do. And he said, I began right there in Damascus, began preaching at Damascus. He went back to Jerusalem and preached at Jerusalem. Uh, he went throughout all of Judea and he proclaimed uh, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he went to the Gentiles and began to proclaim the very same thing. And so Paul is saying, ever since in his encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, ever since that command of him to be this, uh, this missionary, this minister, this witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says, I have sought to be faithful. I did this at Damascus. I did it at Jerusalem. I did it in Judea. And then I went to the Gentiles and I did that, which is where Christ has sent me. And so he mentions all of these things, but he's addressing King Agrippa directly when he says this. Uh, he wants Agrippa to, to hang on his words to understand the importance of the truth of what he is telling him. So what did he proclaim when he went to them? Uh, he proclaimed the same message throughout, wherever he went, whether it was to Jews at their synagogues or to Gentiles uh, in these different cities. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that what he proclaimed was repentance uh, and a turning to God and then uh, as a result of that, performing deeds in keeping with or appropriate to such repentance. And so uh, Paul is proclaiming repentance. Repentance is a turning away from sin of all sorts, uh, not harboring sin at all, but turning away from sin once and for all, and then uh, turning to God. That, that's faith. That's the opposite side of the coin. That's turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's turning to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore Paul uh, proclaimed faith in Christ as that turning to God. And then he preached that the result of that ought to be sanctification in the lives of newfound believers, that they would begin to put into practice sanctified actions, that they would begin to do deeds that were in keeping with repentance, uh, such things as uh, uh, showing love and kindness toward one another rather than being uh, full of hatred and envy and seeking to destroy one another. And so the gospel turns a person's life completely upside down. It changes motives in all ways, and it should always produce a changed life. There's no such thing as a person who is a Christian whose life is not touched in every respect by the gospel and changed in every way by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul proclaimed that, that this change would be real, that it would happen, that it would take place uh, as a result of turning away from sin and turning to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also proclaimed, along with this, uh, the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he was doing this when he was at the temple in Jerusalem, when the mob seized him and they tried to kill him. 
Uh, but he says, I obtained help from God, and therefore I am able to stand before you this day testifying both to the uh, very important folks who are here as well as those who are less important to the small and to the great, whoever they might happen to be uh, here and elsewhere, uh, that the, that very same thing that is taught in the scriptures. He says, nothing other than what the prophets and what Moses also proclaimed, that what they prophesied would take place. And then he specifies that Christ would suffer, that Christ would suffer. Uh, this is not some new doctrine made up by the Apostle Paul. This is not some new idea that Christians came up with that was unheard of throughout history. This is the culmination of what the Old Testament taught. This is the prophecy uh, given throughout the Old Testament by Moses and by the prophets that the Christ who was to come would be a suffering servant, that he would suffer at the hands of sinful men. And so Paul's preaching was not his own uh, unique invention. Uh, Paul is saying what the Old Testament scriptures teach, that the Christ would suffer at the hands of wicked men, and that his sufferings would lead to his death and to his burial, but that also he would rise again from the dead on the third day. And so that by reason of his resurrection, he goes on. So he talks about the sufferings, implies the death and burial, and then speaks of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, and that as a result of Christ being raised from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim uh, light to both the Jews and to the Gentiles. Now notice that once again, Paul comes back to this, this concept of light. He talks about light, and it's the light of salvation. It's the light of the glory of God. It's the light of the kingdom of God. Uh, whenever we see God, uh, we, we see uh, light in Scripture. And so well, we're told in the Bible that uh, God dwells in unapproachable light. Uh, if you've ever been to an uh, ophthalmologist, you've had an eye exam, uh, you know that there's that one place where they dilate your eyes and you look through uh, those uh, binocular type things and then the, uh, the doctor shines a bright light into your eye to be able uh, to see the retina. And sometimes that light is painful. Uh, imagine that multiplied by billions and trillions of times. Our God dwells in unapproachable light. God is so holy. Light's the only thing that can describe Him. He is so holy that the light of God is so brilliant that it would vaporize sinners to attempt to stand in His presence. And so uh, it is the light of God that is proclaimed. It is the light that represents who God is. It is the light that represents His glory. It's the light that represents the salvation that is ours through Christ. And so the kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of darkness, but the kingdom of God is the kingdom of light. And it's the light of the glory of God. And it is that glory of God that is seen in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is summing everything up by saying that he preached the light of, uh, the, uh, of God's glorious salvation uh, that was first proclaimed by the risen Lord Jesus Christ and that he, as the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, is taking up that challenge. He is also proclaiming these very same things. Uh, he is proclaiming to both Jews and Gentiles uh, that they are to turn to the light of God found only uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glorious Messiah. Uh, he is the Savior of uh, sinners, both from uh, the Jews as well as from the Gentiles. And now we see the reaction of the two men who are present, well, along with many others, of course, but Festus and Herod Agrippa, uh, who are present as Paul presents these things. Uh, Paul has finally spoken of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead in very clear terms, and it seems like this is the point at which Festus finally understands the truth that he has not understood up until this point. Uh, we saw last time that uh, Festus was confused about uh, what Paul and the Jewish leaders disagreed over, that Festus thought 
that the Jewish leaders said Jesus is dead and that Paul says, no, no, he's alive. But it never entered Festus's mind that Paul was saying he is alive because he rose from the dead. Uh, he assumed wrongly, uh, apparently, that Jesus escaped being killed, that the Jewish leaders thought they'd killed him, but somehow or other Jesus escaped being put to death and that Paul knew this and that's what he was proclaiming. Now for the first time, it seems, Festus finally hears clearly uh, the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ from the dead and it suddenly strikes him. This is what Paul is on trial for. This is what Paul has been proclaiming and he cannot believe it. Uh, it never entered his mind and now he reacts to it and he reacts to it uh, by saying, Paul, you're nuts, you're crazy. Uh, your great learning has driven you insane. He cannot accept the resurrection of someone from the dead. He doesn't believe that. Uh, and much less would he believe that the one who rose from the dead was a Jewish rabbi who had been executed by Roman authorities. And so there are all sorts of reasons that Festus would reject this, but mostly the reason is that he's an unbeliever. Uh, he uh, has not trusted in Christ. He cannot comprehend these things. And now that it begins to dawn on him that, that Paul is preaching the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, this is beyond the pale as far as Festus is concerned. This is insanity. This is craziness. You're, you're insane, Paul, is what he says. Paul's response to Festus is a very short, very brief, but very accurate one. Uh, he simply denies that he's insane. Uh, he says, I'm not mad. He says, what I'm speaking are words of sober truth. Uh, that word sober uh, is a term that means sensible. It means I'm in my right mind and what I'm saying makes sense. It is the truth. It's, it's making sense. I'm not drunk. I'm not on drugs. I'm, there's nothing wrong with my thinking. This is the absolute truth, and I am in my right mind to proclaim it in this way. And so uh, he is saying essentially uh, that his, res uh, his response to the resurrection, Paul's response to the resurrection, is the most logical, the most sane, the most rational, the most serious, that, uh, and that because of that, Festus himself ought to consider that what Paul is saying to him is the truth. And then Paul turns once again to King Agrippa and addresses him directly and says uh, to Festus, the king knows all about this. Uh, and I am therefore able to speak to him with confidence because I know that these matters did not escape his notice. They weren't done in some obscure corner somewhere, some obscure corner of the kingdom. They weren't done in some obscure corner of some dark room uh, they were done in the open, they were done at Jerusalem, they were done uh, in the light, and therefore uh, everybody knows these events that was anywhere near Jerusalem at this time or knew anything about uh, Jerusalem at this time. And so he's saying uh, King Agrippa knows these things. He, he is convinced of that. It has not escaped his notice. Uh, Agrippa is well-versed in, in uh, Jewish tradition, Jewish customs, and he certainly must have understood and heard of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he uh, turns to him and basically says, uh, addressing him uh, directly, do you believe the prophets? And then before he ever has a chance to answer, Paul says, I know you do. I know you do because you are a scholar. You are someone who has studied these things. You are someone who is known to know these things. And therefore, it is right and it is proper for me to address these things to you. I know that you know the prophets. I know that you know that these are the things prophesied in the scriptures. And therefore, these are the things fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Agrippa responds. And he responds uh, with an answer that is uh, translated very, very differently depending on the Bible translation that you're using. 
Uh, let's look at a few of these various ways that different Bibles translate what uh, Agrippa says in response to Paul. Uh, we're reading from the New American Standard, uh, and it says, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Uh, that seems to indicate that Paul has made an impression upon the king and that he is about to become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The English Standard Version says, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Uh, indicating there, it sounds like uh, Agrippa is rejecting what the Apostle Paul has uh, just said to him. You, you, would you persuade me to be a Christian in, in this short time? The King James Version says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, as if you just about had me there, Paul, but not quite. You missed it by just about that much. And the uh, New Century Version says, Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian in such a short time? As though the element of time is the important factor in this. So look at that. All these different translations for the same words uh, ranging from, I'm about ready to be persuaded, I'm almost there, you just missed me by that much, or do you really think that in a short period of time you can persuade me of what you're saying? Now, how should we understand what the king is saying here? We know from history, at least it seems from history, that Agrippa never publicly professed any faith of any kind in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, however, we... Uh, read this then, it must be some sort of rejection and some sort of rebuff of this call to repent of sin and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it could very well be uh, that it is, uh, that the king is stating something about the shortness of this uh, presentation that's been made of the gospel of Jesus Christ that in such a short period of time do you really think you can convince me of these things uh, and Paul in any case picks up on the time element that uh, the king mentions and so what Paul says is whether in a short time or a long time what I desire is that everyone who is hearing me would become just exactly like I am. In other words, would become a Christian, except for these chains. He doesn't want to insult his audience. He doesn't want to say, King, you need to be uh, in chains. No, he is saying, except for the chains, I want you to be exactly like I am, which is a repentant sinner who has come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been converted by the grace of Almighty God and is now trusting and living for Christ and for Christ alone, who is living in the light, who is living by the glory of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul wants Agrippa to come to see. That's what he wants Festus to come to see. That's what he wants Bernice to come to see. That's what he wants all of these lords and ladies who are assembled together in this room. Uh, he wants them to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is an earnest appeal on the part of the Apostle Paul asking for uh, Agrippa to repent and to believe in Jesus. Uh, the irony of all of this is what happens. And that simply is that at this point, uh, the uh, main folks here, uh, Festus and Agrippa and Bernice and, and the others stand up and they leave the room, uh, leaving Paul there, uh, perhaps by himself except for the guards. And they begin to talk among themselves. And they begin to discuss what Paul has said to them. And they come to the conclusion that they... Or they're not persuaded by the gospel message. They're, they're not talking about, well, we really ought to do what Paul said. That's not at all what they talk about. And so neither of these men appear uh, in Scripture to have been uh, convinced of the gospel, or have been converted by what the Apostle Paul said, uh, but rather they conclude Paul is not doing anything, has not done anything, that is worthy either of being kept in jail or of being sent to Rome to be tried uh, and executed. He's not worthy of anything uh, that would cause the death penalty, and he's not even worthy of anything that would keep him imprisoned. 
As a matter of fact, we could let him go, Agrippa said, if it were not for the fact that Paul had appealed to Caesar. And so they're sort of stuck. Uh, maybe paperwork's already been filed. Who knows? Uh, uh, the bureaucracy in Rome already knows Paul's on his way. They're just waiting for the transcript of the charges so that they'll know what to charge him on. And it would be a really a bad form, I guess, Festus is thinking, uh, that he couldn't release Paul now because he's already told his superiors this man's on his way and he'll be bringing the charges along with him when he comes. And so uh, they're sort of stuck in this situation. Uh, perhaps they're stuck by the way the whole thing is, is uh, uh, formatted as far as Rome is concerned. And they say, you know, we really could let him go. If he had not said he appealed to Caesar, but now he's got to go to Caesar because he appealed and we have to send him because that is our duty. He's out from under our jurisdiction. He's under the jurisdiction of Rome now and we have to send him on. And so uh, here we have Herod Agrippa II proclaiming about a Christian that this man is not worthy of being killed. He's, he has not done anything for which he deserves to die, or for which he even deserves to be kept into prison. Uh, we saw in the, in the last message that uh, the Herod family was a terrible family, uh, that they uh, killed the uh, children in Bethlehem, that they killed uh, the, uh, John the Baptist, uh, that they killed the apostle James, and uh, persecuted uh, Christians left and right. And here, this one man from this family says about a Christian, this man's not worthy of death. And so uh, Herod, at the very least, was fair in that regard uh, and did give Paul a hearing. But just like any unbeliever, uh, his eyes were still blinded. Uh, though uh, the light of the glory of God was proclaimed, uh, Herod and Festus both continued to be blind men. And though the light was proclaimed very clearly, the light was on, it was the glory of God, they were spiritually blind and they needed to have the Holy Spirit give them eyes to see, and that has not happened. Friend, if you're listening to me today, has the Lord opened your eyes to see the, uh, the light of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have uh, you, you've heard the gospel, you understand that uh, indeed faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, that, that Christ is the only Savior of sinners, that it is his life, his death, his resurrection uh, that changes everything, and that all men everywhere are called to turn away from sin and turn to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard that. Has God opened your eyes, given you as a spiritually blind man, eyes now to see the truth of the light of the glory of God in Christ? If he has, then flee to him, trust in him, live for him all the rest of your life. Let us pray once again. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed the God of light, God of glory, uh, that your kingdom is a kingdom of light. And I pray, Lord, that you would shed and shine the light abroad uh, upon all who would see and hear this message, that you would open their eyes, give these spiritually blind folks eyes to see the glory of Christ and to turn to him trusting in him by the faith that you grant. We pray, Lord, that uh, there would be many who would flee from sin and would turn to you and would then do deeds in keeping with their repentance, that they would begin to love and to serve Christ and uh, to treat one another uh, with uh, grace, uh, like the grace that they have received through Christ. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week. I look forward to bringing the Word of God again to you next Lord's Day.